And our speaker is Todd Morrison. So Todd is a technology transfer engineer with T2. Um, he's taught over 700 workshops and trained over 21,000 individuals. He retired from the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet after serving in the divisions of construction, maintenance, and traffic. And at the cabinet, he worked with environmental, work zone, construction, and maintenance concerns as an environmental coordinator, maintenance traffic engineer, and as a branch manager for operations. Uh, recently, Todd served for two years as our safety circuit rider here in Kentucky, um, helping local agencies identify low-cost improvements to reduce crashes on the roadways. And he's a certified public manager and an ATSA certified traffic control supervisor, flagging instructor, and traffic control design specialist. So you all are in great hands today. Todd is very knowledgeable and very qualified to leave this webinar. And we hope that you will learn a lot from it. And please, again, feel free to interact and ask questions as those arise. I am gonna drop a file into our chat box. That's just the slide deck from today. So you can access those and take notes on that if you would like to. Um, otherwise, the presentation is displayed for you. And Todd, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Brittany. I want to say welcome. Welcome to Work Zones for Local Agencies, Set Up Removal and Management, our webinar Wednesday topic for this week. And again, I really appreciate you being here and I appreciate your interest in making our work zones safer and being able to do a better job with that. I'm going to dive right into the material because Brittany did a great job in presenting the introduction. I want to make sure that we get to two topics. We have an hour, so two topics is really the most we could do. The first one is job site setup and removal. How can we do that and give you and your crew the best chance of making it? And that's really the goal. We want to improve your odds of not being and the number of people that are injured or killed in our work zones. That's the first goal. The next one is going to be, how do we manage that job site? So we have it set up. we got the work zone in place. What do we need to do to manage that job site? And these are both important, again, because we want to make sure that your odds of making it and those of your team members, those crew members that you send out into the field, that they're as good as we can possibly get them. Now, how dangerous is it out there? Well, you know, because you're out there working, uh, many of you, every day of the week, or you have individuals that are out there working. And really, out there on the roadway, you're never really safe. You're trying to do a job. You're trying to get the road maintained or constructed. And you've got to worry about two-ton, four-ton, 40-ton pieces of steel that are flying past you. And they're going 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 miles an hour. Any of those get loose in the work zone, it could be lights out for you. And these injuries or fatalities in our work zones, they do happen. These are the numbers from 2021. 956 work zone fatalities around the nation for that year. That's really the uh, what we're trying to bring down, the number we're trying to reduce. Then we had 164 pedestrians, which includes workers, that were killed in work zones. Again, that's what we're trying to prevent from happening. We want to decrease the odds of your crew members being in this number or yourself. In addition, we had 42,000 people that were injured. Now, these injuries, sometimes you get better, sometimes you don't. You know, sometimes they last a lifetime. And we want to make sure that you're not in that category either. So how do we do that? The way that we do it is by beginning with the MUTCD. The MUTCD is a manual on uniform traffic control devices. It is a federal document put out by the Federal Highway Administration. It has been adopted as state law, and it applies to all roads open to public travel, city streets, county roads, or state routes equally. And in there, we're going to get some information, some details, some requirements, and some recommendations for good planning and design of our work zones. And that will help reduce injuries and fatalities, increase your odds of essentially making it. If you want to get a full copy of the MUTCD, if you don't have one, 
you can go to this website, metcd.fhwa.dot.gov, and you can download a full version. There are nine chapters or nine parts. Gram part six, that deals with temporary traffic control. And when you look in that part, you see some verbiage that goes over really the setup of work zones. And that's what we're talking about today, job site setup and removal. And here's what it says. Only those individuals who are trained in temporary traffic control practices have a basic understanding should supervise the selection, placement, and maintenance of temporary traffic control devices. And that's really the first tip for today is make sure that whoever is setting that work zone up for you is competent, that they know what they're doing. And if they don't, get them some training. Make sure they've been trained in that. We offer training. There are many other places to get training as well, but I have to say ours is excellent. And I encourage you to send your employees to the flagger, the traffic control technician, and the traffic control supervisor workshops. That's going to go a long way towards helping your crew be safer. So definitely encourage you to check those out. So we're going to use the MUTCD, MUTCD today. In addition, we're going to use this book. This is the ATSA field guide to the installation and removal of temporary traffic control devices for maintenance and uh, work zone operations. Now, if you're not familiar with ATSA, that's the American Traffic Safety Services Association. They're a large organization that does training for work zone traffic control, but also they do a lot of research for the Federal Highway Administration. And this is a document that they put together as part of that research for the FHWA. If you want to grab a copy of it, you can download it here, worksonesafety.org. Encourage you to go and get that. And what I'd like to do is walk through what this book says about setting up a work zone, because it is a method or one way that you could use or order of operations that you could use to set up your work zone that will help keep your employees a little bit safer, reduce your odds of being in that number of individuals that are killed or injured. And as we look at this document, it says, step one, really good common sense, review the temporary traffic control plan. Whoever's setting up that job site for you, or if that's you, make sure that you look over the temporary traffic control plan. And here's a great idea, have a temporary traffic control plan for that work that you're going to go do today. Now, that could be simple. It could be as simple as one of the typical applications out of the back of part six of the MUTCD. This is TA10 that you see on the left-hand side. That's the one that deals with the typical flagger setup from part six of the MUTCD. But you could simply take this, print it out, photocopy it, and write in the distances for the spacing of your signs, uh, your cones, your buffer space, et cetera. And that could be a simple temporary traffic control plan. They also get more complex, though. On the right-hand side, this is one from the city of Las Vegas, where they were going to be working on a multi-lane road as it approached one of their busy intersections. Much more complex, but again, whoever is setting that up, they need to know <clears throat> what's going on. And as they do, you want to be thinking about the golden rule of plan reading. And that's read everything. Because that traffic control designer, if they put notes on there, there was a reason for it. If they drew something in, there was a reason for it. And oftentimes, they try to put a lot of information into a small space. They have to. And in order to figure out what's going on and what you need to do, what you might be required to do, you need to look at the entire drawing. So that's step one, review the temporary traffic control plan. Step two, make sure that you have enough temporary traffic control and it is in good working order. Now, what do I mean by that? For example, you want to make sure that you have enough. Let's say you're doing a flag in operation. You're going to use cones to set up that flag in operation. Your crew wants to make sure or needs to make sure whoever's in charge of that work zone 
needs to make sure that you have enough cones on the truck before you leave the garage. Otherwise, if they're like my crews, when I worked for KYTC, man, if they left and they didn't have enough stuff, they never came back to the barn. They just made do with what they had. Those cones would be spaced out further apart than they should have been. Or maybe they didn't have the right signs. For the typical flagger setup, it's road work, one lane road, flagger, head symbol signs. Maybe they didn't have all those. Well, what did they do? They just put up what they had. How do you make sure that you have enough? You could, the afternoon before, if you know what you're going to be doing, have someone load up the back of the truck. Or that morning before you leave the garage. And you would need to be familiar with the work zone traffic control plan to make sure that you know what's needed. And you can have enough items or enough temporary traffic control devices. Another way is some agencies will actually have a temporary traffic control trailer. And they might have several crews that come out of their maintenance facility. And each crew will have its own temporary traffic control trailer. Because if you don't do this, I mean, it is important. If you don't do this, you end up with items like this. This is a fairly large city that decided to close this road or this city street. And the way they did it leaves a lot to be desired. I can just go ahead and tell you without getting into a lot of detail that, yeah, that's no good. So they didn't have enough or the correct type. If you want to up your game and making sure that you have enough temporary traffic control devices, you could do what the city of Munster Indiana did. This is what the city of Munster did. They went to the surplus auction. They bought an old ambulance. They took this old ambulance and they outfitted it to be their temporary traffic control vehicle. In this old ambulance, there's all kinds of room for the different cones they might need, the signs, the sign stands, everything else that they need to set up the work zones that they typically set up. They even had some fun with it. They had a wrap made, but this wrap isn't just any, any wrap. The picture that you see is actually the winner of a poster contest. They got with the local school system and they had the school kids compete in a poster con contest to help raise awareness that they're out here, they're working, and people need to pay attention to them. Well, that winning poster they had made into a wrap and they covered up that old ambulance with the winning poster. And I'm told this works out great. Talk to the city of Munster. Works out very well, except during the summertime. And that's because this ambulance still has power in the back of it, which means they also have a microwave and a refrigerator in there. And the crew will go in and have their lunch inside in the air conditioning in the middle of the summertime in the AC, and it's hard to get them back out. So they have to run them back out after lunch, but that's the only trouble that they have with it. So that's step one. Review the temporary traffic control plan. Step two, make sure that you have enough temporary traffic control. The next step is just make sure that the crew knows what's going on. Because if you don't, if your crew doesn't know what's going on or what their role is, you can have a lot of errors happen. You can actually get out there into the field and everybody's running around like ants and they're not sure what they're supposed to be doing. So give them the knowledge that they need. Have a little crew meeting before you leave the maintenance lot um, or before you get out there on the roadway. Make sure they know. If I'm the person that is hauling in rock or asphalt to the job, I need to know how am I supposed to get in? Where do you want me to go? How do you want me to get into that job site? If I'm the flagger, one of the flaggers, I need to know. Am I the closed lane flagger, the open lane flagger? Who's going to release their traffic first? You know, do our radios work? If it's an intersection, man, you really want to communicate. What are we doing and how are we going to get this done? So that they know what's going on, but also their role in setting that up. Step four is to consider, especially for complicated jobs, going to the job site and marking the location of the signs and the cones maybe the tapers, the buffer space, before the crew gets out there. 
And we would do this when I worked at KYTC. Not every time, but if it was a really complicated setup, we might go out there and lay it out the afternoon before. I'd give it a foreman or a supervisor for that county. We might go out there with some paint and mark out where everything's going to be. Uh, especially if it was complicated or maybe it was a really high speed location with lots of traffic. If I was going to close the lane on the interstate, I wanted to get in and out as quick as possible. I wanted to get that lane closure set up as quickly and efficiently as possible. Because if you're out there working on the interstate, man, you are exposed. Every minute that you're out there, you're in great danger. So you want to make sure that you set that up as quickly and efficiently as possible. In some cases, if we thought people wouldn't steal the drums or the signs, we would actually put those out ahead of time as well. I might stage those just off the shoulder and have them ready to put in place the next morning. So how would we do that? Well, the way that we would do that is we would use temporary paint. And in that ATSA guide, they're going to suggest that you use white or pink paint. And that's so that it's not confused with other colors, which might be reserved for certain utilities. But we would mark the location of everything out there. This particular drawing is TA33 from part six of the METCD. And this is um, for the long term or the intermediate setup, case A. But as you're looking at this, let's say that I was going to go set this up or not set it up, but we were going to lay this out. I get together with Bruce. We're going to go out there this afternoon and set this up because tomorrow the crew is going to go out and install all this temporary traffic control. And I want to get it done as quickly as possible. The first thing we would do is mark off the work area, however long we needed it to be. But I would put a paint mark here and a paint mark here to mark off the work area on the shoulder. Or if this was downtown with curb and gutter, four lanes, I might put that on the gutter line. Then we would measure for the buffer space. 70 miles an hour, that's 730 feet. So I would measure 730 feet. And I would put a paint mark here with an arrow to the right saying BS, buffer space, an arrow to the left saying ET, end of the taper. Then it would measure for this taper. If this is 70 miles an hour, 12 foot wide lane, that taper is going to be 840 feet in length. So I would measure that and put a paint mark here. And that would be BT, beginning of the taper. From that point, I could then measure for a, B, and C, our signs. A thousand feet for Freeway Expressway, for A, 1500 for B, 2640 for C. And we would measure those out, put the paint marks down, mark those locations. Now, tomorrow morning, it is much easier for the crew to get that installed. It's also much quicker for us to get in, out there, get the work done, and get back off the road. Now, those distances, how do you get those? Well, it depends on the length. If I'm talking about the A, B, and C in that particular case, 1,000, 1,500, 2640, then I could use the vehicle odometer. Or in a rural area, those signs would be 500 feet apart. And I could use my truck odometer for that. 500 feet or one-tenth of a mile on your truck odometer is equal to 528 feet. So that's going to be close enough for the 500 foot spacing for A, B, and C in a rural area. Out on the interstate, this is 1,000 feet, so that's two tenths of a mile. Again, that's going to be good enough for the spacing of this. B is 1,500 feet, three tenths of a mile. C is 2,640 or half a mile. So that would put my road work sign one mile from the beginning of this taper if I were setting up by the MUTCD. But you can use your vehicle odometer to approximate 500 feet. You could also use a measuring wheel. You know, if I were in the middle of the city setting up a flagging operation and my taper for the flagging operation is 50 to 100 feet, then a measuring wheel would be just fine for that. 
You could also use a well calibrated set of legs. But I do want you to calibrate your legs. And what I want you to do is in the parking lot, measure off 100 feet and then step that off three or four times. Take the average because I'm sure some of you are a lot taller than me and you're going to take fewer steps to get to 100 feet than I am. So you got to figure out how much is that for you. You could also use something we call the skip line method, but that doesn't mean you're skipping down the road. It actually refers to the spacing of these broken lines. That's what the METCD would call them in part three. Anytime we have a passing zone marked and we have these center broken lines or center skip lines, they're on a set pattern. And by the way, this is the same for four lane roads. If I have a multi lane road with those white broken lines or white skip marks separating traffic going the same direction, the pattern is this pain mark will be 10 feet in length. And the gap from the end of this one to the next is 30 feet. If you add that up, that's 10 plus 30 or 40 feet from the beginning of one paint mark to the next. Now let's think about that in terms of maybe the flagger setup. In the flagging operation, TA10 would tell us that that flagging taper is 50 to 100 feet. That would be this drawing that I showed you earlier. The flagging taper, those cones that close off that lane, 50 to 100 feet. I could make that two and a half skip lines, 40 plus 40 plus 20, and I'd have 100 feet. So those skip lines can be used as a unit of measurement. Other things to check, let's say that it is a flagging operation, we lay that out, we figure out where the flagger is going to stand. We also want to check to make sure that the flagger is visible, they have stopping side distance, and an escape route. Got to love this photo. This particular flagger was visible, although his safety vest wasn't zipped, but he decided to hide himself behind the stop sign. That was on US 31E in Barron County that I took that photo. He was unfortunate enough to have me stop as the first person. So consider, step four was consider laying that out. Now, step five is to install it. And the way that we install the temporary traffic control, quite simply, the first thing we want to do is put out our advanced warning signs. That's first. Next, if we have a flagger, we put them in place. So you have road work, one lane road, flagger, head symbol sign, then your flaggers, and they stop traffic. And they stop traffic while another couple of members of the crew install the cones or drums, whatever channelization devices that you're using. And typically, we would install those with the flow of traffic. That's what the um, ATSA field guide would say. And then the work crew can begin. Just to illustrate that for you, first you'd put out the signs for each direction. Then you have the flaggers get in place. Once they're in place, they stop traffic. And then these cones are installed with the flow of traffic. Once you do that, the very next thing you want to do, step six, is to inspect the work zone. We want you to drive through the job site to make sure that, one, it's set up the way that you intended for it to be. Everything's there, all the signs, all the other devices, where you want them to be. But also, make sure it's working. Because sometimes we'll draw something up in the office, and it looks great on paper. But you get out there in the field, and now it's not working too good. So make sure, watch the traffic, observe it. Make sure that what you installed is actually working. If there's anything wrong, fix it. And then write down that you did an inspection and that you, what you corrected. Because again, what that does is it shows a good faith effort towards having the work zone set up correctly and functioning properly. Functioning properly. So what might you find on that initial inspection? Now we'll check out this photo. This comes to us from Montrose County, Colorado. This is a county road and they set up a work zone and they didn't intend for this to be installed improperly. 
but on their initial inspection, they found this. And what had happened is they had a new person helping install the temporary traffic control. And the guy just wasn't paying attention. And he put this one in upside down. And it's things like this and others that you're looking for in that initial inspection. Step seven is when the job's done, take down your temporary traffic control. And that's something that the METCD will tell us that we have to do. This is a shall condition. All temporary traffic control devices shall be removed as soon as practical when they're no longer needed. Even if work is suspended for short periods of time, those temporary traffic control devices that aren't needed shall be removed or covered. So that means that if they're out on temporary stands, we're going to take them down. If they're up on post, and sometimes we'll do that because on a temporary stand, the minimum height is one foot, but it can only stay at that one foot height for up to three days. After that, we have to meet the same mounting height requirements as our permanent signs. So quite often, that's when long-term operations will raise the signs up. And when we do that, oftentimes, especially for long-term projects, we'll put them on post. When that's a little bit hard to cover them, what we would suggest is you use something that is light, deformable, uh, like geotextile fabric, and completely cover the sign with it. The one in the middle, that would be the most desirable. The one on the left, the one on the right, not so good. So when you go to do step seven, you're done with the job. Here's how we remove that temporary traffic control. We do it in reverse order the way we installed it. The first thing that happens is the work crew gets off the road. Makes good sense. Then we remove the cones or the drums and that adds a guide would say against the flow of the traffic beginning at the end of the job, the downstream taper coming through the work area, the buffer space, all the way up to the beginning taper. And as you look at different states, there's a little bit of variance in how they do that. But again, we're talking about the ATSA field guide. So I'm gonna give you their guidance on that. Not the MUTCD, by the way. So it's not state law, but it's just good advice. Once you get those cones or drums up, then the flaggers come up, they come off the road, and then the warning signs are taken up. Using that same TA-10 for illustration, the first thing that would happen is the work crew would get off the road, the flaggers go to stop, they hold traffic, and then these cones come up from the end of the job through the work area, the buffer space, all the way to the beginning. Once the cones come up, the flaggers are taken up, and then the signs are removed. Now that's how we would normally do it, the installation and the removal of the temporary traffic control devices. And that's true for every case, except detours. Detours are a little bit different. With detours, we want to start at the end of the job with our signs, or the end of the detour, and work back to the beginning for the initial install. The reason is that if I were to start at the beginning of the detour, putting up the detour signs, people might actually follow those signs. And then they're gonna get into an area where they're lost because I, I don't have all the signs up yet. So with the detour, we start at the end, work back to the beginning for the initial install, and then we take it down in reverse order from the beginning to the end. I'd like to show you a video clip. This is about four or five minutes, and it's gonna go over and review what we talked about with work zone setup. To set up a flagging operation on a two lane, two way traffic road, it's best to locate and mark the different parts of the work zone. To do this, you'll need a way to measure and mark distances. A measuring wheel, center skip lines, in some cases a truck odometer using one-tenth of a mile as 528 feet or a well-calibrated stride will work to measure. If using paint to mark the locations, white or pink are the preferred colors. Begin by marking the ending and beginning of the work area. The work area can be as large as you need it to be to get the job done. Keep the size to a minimum though to inhibit traffic as little as possible. From the beginning of the work area, measure and mark the beginning of the buffer space. 
The suggested buffer space distance is based upon the speed and given in Table 6E-1 from the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. At 55 miles per hour, the suggested buffer space would be 495 feet. From the beginning of the buffer space, measure and mark the beginning of the taper. The taper is the series of cones on an angle to close off the lane. For a flagging setup, this taper will be 50 to 100 feet in length. The beginning of the taper is also the flagger's station. At this point, make sure the flagger will have an escape route and good visibility. At 55 miles per hour, this required visibility would be 495 feet. From the beginning of the taper, measure and mark the location of the flagger ahead sign. This distance is given in Table 6H-3 from the MUTCD. You must decide if you're in an urban or rural area. If you're in a rural area, the distance between the signs is a minimum of 500 feet. This distance can be approximated using one-tenth of a mile on your truck odometer or using the measuring wheel. If you're in an urban area, you must decide if the road is low speed or high speed. Most agencies choose 40 miles per hour or less as low speed and 45 miles per hour or more as high speed. Refer to your highway agency if you're unsure. From the flagger ahead sign, measure and mark the location of the one lane road sign. This distance will also come from table 6H-3. For a rural area, it's also 500 feet. From the one lane road sign, measure and mark the location of the road work sign. This distance will also come from table 6H-3. For a rural area, it will also be 500 feet. Now you're ready to install the traffic control devices. Begin by placing the road work signs, followed by the one lane road signs, followed by the flagger ahead signs at the locations marked. Ensure that the signs are at least 36 inches by 36 inches wide for a conventional road and retro reflective if used at night. Once you have the signs installed for both directions, then place your flaggers into position and have them stop traffic in each direction. While traffic is stopped, place your cones beginning at the upstream end with the beginning of the taper that closes the lane. This taper is 50 to 100 feet in length and should have cones spaced at no more than 20 feet apart. Cones should be orange in color and a minimum of 18 inches tall for daylight and low speed applications. When the speeds are 45 or higher or you are working at night, the minimum size cone is 28 inches with two white retro reflective strips. Continue placing cones throughout the buffer space, work area, and downstream taper if you have one. The cones in the buffer space and work area have a maximum spacing of two times the speed limit in feet. The cones in the downstream taper have a maximum spacing of 20 feet. Once all the signs and cones are in place, the work crew can begin. It's also a good idea to do a drive-through inspection of the work zone to make sure that everything has been installed correctly. The traffic control is removed in the reverse order as it's installed. First, the work crew gets off the road. Next, the flaggers stop traffic. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that video as a summary of what we talked about as far as the installation and the removal. And again, that's your best bet to keep you and your crew from being in these numbers. Any questions that you have, again, feel free to put those in the chat box or unmute and ask. Be happy to try to answer those. And I don't see any, so I want to ask you a couple of questions. Just to test your memory a little bit, I'm going to launch a couple of poll questions. So come on up to the laptop if you've moved away or the, the computer and help me out with this question. The number of work zone fatalities in the U.S. in 2021 was how much? How many work zone fatalities? Do you recall us having? So go ahead and jump in, get your vote counted. There's no penalty for a wrong answer. If you get it wrong, you're not automatically kicked off the webinar. I think it's three. If you get three wrong, you're kicked off the webinar. No, just kidding. You get to stay. Give you just a couple more seconds to get your answer in. And the majority of you got it correct, 956. Yeah, great job. By the way, that 42,000 number that was answer D, 
That's the total number of fatalities on roads in the U.S. for that same year. So definitely it's something that, and we want to do what, all that we can to bring down. Here's another one. Question three, suggested colors for marking the location of traffic control devices. We mentioned two colors. Do you remember which two those were? We'll go ahead and share the results with you. Great job. Absolutely, the answer is white and pink. 92% of you got that correct. Yeah, fantastic job. We'll do one more, and then I'll answer the question in the chat box, and then we'll talk about the management of a job site. Question five, temporary traffic control devices shall be removed. What do you think? This is one of those things that we quoted from the MUTCD, one of the shalls. Great job. Everybody's voted almost in 30 seconds. The best answer is A and C. As soon as practical, it also said when work is suspended for short periods of time. So it's both A and C. The good news is nobody picked B. B was right out. So great job. All right, in the chat box, we have a question that says, can the distances for tapers and sign spacing be more than the minimum recommended? The answer is yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, well, yes, absolutely. For everything but the flagging taper and the downstream taper. The flagging taper, 50 to 100 feet, we keep it short intentionally because when people think they have to stop for the traffic, or sorry, stop for the flagger and not merge, but every all the rest of them, the merging tapers on the interstate, uh, the merging tapers anywhere else, shoulder tapers, all of those, they can be longer. And as a matter of fact, that's a safety upgrade to make them longer. So on the interstate, instead of making it 840 feet, like I mentioned, if I wanted to make it two tenths of a mile, I could. The same with your signage. Those numbers from that chart are suggested advanced warning sign spacing. And there's a little bit of wiggle room, more or less, because you also want to place it where people can see it. So we select the best spot for visibility. I have another question on a multi-lane facility, interstate or parkway. What is the guidance on signage for denoting whether left or right lane is closed? Great question. So that is the TA33 that we looked at. There's a couple of different things that you would consider for the signage. One, we had the signage that is recommended or suggested by the MUTCD, and that's dual mounted road work, right lane closed, and merge left if we're closing this right lane. And then if it was the left lane, it would be road work, left lane closed, and the merge right transition sign. KYTC, if you're working for them or you're working on interstate or parkway um, in Kentucky, they're gonna increase that amount of signage through the standard drawings. And instead of having one right lane or left lane closed in this series, they'll have two. So they'll give the public two opportunities to see that the right lane is closed in writing. And it's just a way of making that a little bit safer. So you have the METCD, three signs, dual mounted as you approach it. KYTC standard drawings would add a fourth sign. They would repeat this right or left lane closed. Yeah, good questions. Well, let's talk about the second objective, and that is how do we manage a job site? And I want to go through this fairly quickly because I want to allow a little bit of room for, or a little bit of time for questions at the end. But when we talk about job site management, we go back to the MUTCD. This is the bare minimum for work zones within our state for city streets, county roads, state routes. And then your agency, KYTC or the city or county can add other 
more stringent requirements. So as we look at this, and again, we're talking about job site management, in the METCD, it says routine day and night inspections should be performed by individuals who are knowledgeable. That means trained and or certified. And they're given the responsibility for safety. And one of the most important duties they have is to check to make sure all the temporary traffic control devices are consistent with the plan and they're working. So that means that someone with your crew needs to be designated. They need to be trained and or certified first, and then they need to be designated as the person over that and do routine day and night inspections of those work zones if they're up long term. We would also suggest once per shift. And again, that training certification you can get through us. It goes on to say as a work progresses, temporary traffic control devices should be modified if needed for safety. And that goes back to observing the traffic to see what's going on. But also it means looking at those any crashes or incidents that occur in the work zone. It says that these work zones should be carefully monitored under different conditions of traffic volume, light, whether it's day or night, and weather. You need to look at if it's a long-term job, you need to look at it when it's raining. How's the drainage? What's going on? Is everything visible? In addition, good job site management would include crash record monitoring. In other words, if you have crashes in your work zones or collisions, you need to look at that and review it to determine what happened. Was there some kind of defect in your work zone traffic control that maybe contributed to the crash or the severity of it? Or maybe you have everything right, but if these crashes keep happening, then you need to look at upgrading what you have out there, going above and beyond the bare minimum, because we don't want any more collisions. We, we, don't, wanna, we don't want those to continue because they lead to injuries and fatalities. So it means in order to figure out if you need to do anything, we have to monitor the crashes happening in your job site. So let's go over the language that was written and we'll talk about job site management with what the METCD had to say. The first thing was to inspect the job site. Now, earlier I told you to do an initial inspection, but the METCD further admonished you to do a day and nighttime inspection to make sure that it's matching the temporary traffic control plan. So day and night, that's the METCD. If you're working for KYTC, they would say once per shift, uh, it's gonna be an upgrade above and beyond that. But cities and counties, you should have somebody designated to be in charge of that work zone and inspect it day and night. And they're looking to make sure everything's up. It's where it needs to be. It's installed per the temporary traffic control plan. And then these inspections need to be documented. And if you fix anything, they also need to be documented. That's a just shows that you're meeting the requirements of the METCD and making good faith efforts. And any kind of upgrades or modifications for safety that are needed, you document those as well. Now, how would you do that? Well, there are a lot of forms out there that you could use. This is just a snippet of one form, and it's a copy that we could get you a PDF of if you'd like. But this is a simple temporary traffic control visibility mobility inspection worksheet that you could send out with your inspector, that person in charge, the project traffic coordinator, and they could fill this out day and night, or at least, or maybe once per shift if you wanted to upgrade. And what are they looking for? Well, sometimes people use our cones for target practice. In other words, they see how many cones they can knock down with the vehicle as they're going through the work zone. And you don't want this to stay like this all night or all weekend. So that means day and night, once per day, once per night, per the METCD, you're inspecting it. Or it could be, you know, something like this that you find. This also comes from Montrose County, Colorado. And they went out to a work zone on a Saturday morning. It was a long-term setup, a lane closure, and they couldn't find their arrow board. And they're wondering, where'd this thing go? You know, and all their 
drums were messed up too. Anyway, they finally found it off over the hill, but to them, that's like 100 feet down in the canyon. And it turns out on Friday night, some kids came in and they pushed this off over the hill down to the bottom. But you don't know that if you don't inspect, if you don't look. You could also find just problems with the initial setup. You know, maybe maybe there was a six added to the advisory speed. And, uh, you know, that's no good because somebody's going to try to actually go that speed. In addition, while you're out there inspecting, you're going to be monitoring crashes that happen in your work zones and then seeing, is there anything that needs to be done? You know, maybe there's maybe there's not anything. Maybe this person was completely distracted. No way to get their attention, but we should evaluate it. We should monitor, look to see what happened and then respond as appropriate. So that's the thing. Maintain a record of the crashes review those, and then adjust as needed. And I'm gonna encourage you to fill out a crash documentation checklist. Every time you have a crash in your work zone, besides the police report, I also think that you should fill out a crash documentation checklist showing the date, the time, the weather conditions, measuring where everything was on that job site, all the cones, all the drums, how far apart were they, how many did you have, how far apart were the signs? Were the signs 36 inches or 48 inches? Were they retroreflective or not? Were you flagging? Well, who was flagging? Were they certified? Take photos, video, and then sign and date your notes. Not only does that illustrate that you are monitoring crashes, but also this can be really good if a lawsuit arises. It can help protect you versus liability. But as you investigate, You'll be able to figure out what happened with that crash and how do you respond? So when you respond to the crashes in the work zone, there's a lot of upgrades that you could do. And so I'm gonna break these down into four areas and we'll talk about those. The first one is visibility. You could add more visibility to that job site, maybe strobe lights, but you gotta be careful, especially at night and having too many because you could blind the public. You can also use this conspicuity tape on the vehicles. By the way, I had to practice that word three times in the mirror today to make sure that I could say it. Conspicuity tape. That's this red and white tape that helps us see the vehicles. In the advanced warning area, that starts with our very first sign, the roadwork sign, and goes all the way up to that first cone or channelization device that begins to close off that lane. Here's some upgrades you could look at. One, make sure the signs are placed where people can see them. Two, you could make those retroreflective. That's a better sign sheeting material. If you're working for KYTC, they're gonna be required to be retroreflective day and night already. But if you're with the city or county, you can use just painted sign blanks or mesh see-through signs for your roadwork signs during the daytime, and you're required to upgrade at night. But a, uh, safety enhancement would be to make those retroreflective, use a better quality sign day and night. You could also use a bigger sign. For a conventional road, the minimum size is 36 by 36 inches. Freeway Expressway, we upgrade to 48 by 48s. So you could use those larger 48 by 48 signs, even on conventional roads as a safety upgrade, provided you have the shoulder to support them, the width. You could also add lights. These would be type B. They'd be flashing lights that go on to those advanced warning signs. And you could also consider using variable message boards or PCMS, portable changeable message signs. Moving up to the transition area, that's where we're transitioning from something to something else, from two lanes open to traffic, in the case of perhaps closing a lane on the parkway to one lane open to northbound or eastbound traffic. In that case, you could use a longer taper. I told you if I'm closing a lane on the interstate, that taper, 12 foot wide lane, 70 miles an hour is 840 feet in length, but I could make it longer if I wanted to, give people more time to make that maneuver. You could also put those cones or drums closer together. The METCD would say the max spacing is one times the speed limit in the taper that closes the lane. 
on the interstate that's 70 miles an hour, KYTC already brings it in closer and puts a 40 foot max spacing on those, but you could even draw closer if you wanted to. And you could use bigger devices. Maybe it's a flagging operation and you're allowed to use a 28 inch tall cone, but you decide to upgrade to go to 36 or 42 inch tall cones or maybe even drums. And then you can add, if it's drums, warning lights to those. In this case, it'd be a steady burn type C light. In the buffer space, but to answer the question that was uh, given earlier, can that be longer? Yes, you could add a longer buffer space. If this were a flagging operation, 55 miles an hour, the suggested buffer space is 495 feet, but you could make it longer. You could make it a tenth of a mile, two tenths of a mile. We also have a lateral buffer space, the distance between the work and where the traffic is running. And really just as far away as you can get. I mean, sometimes that's two feet, one foot or, or nothing, but the further away you can get, the better it is. You can also, here's some other good ideas for job site management. You can make sure that if you're not using that piece of equipment, it is out of the way. It is out of something we call the clear zone. That's an area measured from the edge of where traffic is running out. As a rule of thumb, it could be 30 feet. Let's say from the white line, the edge line measured out 30 feet. If I'm done paving for the day, I don't want to put my paver in that area because it's close to the road. It's a large fixed object. And if somebody hits it, it could do a lot of damage. Plus, I don't want my asphalt paver damaged either. So I'm going to move that well off the roadway, out of the clear zone. And on a low volume county road, that may be more like 10 feet or I'm gonna tuck it behind guardrail or something like that. I'm gonna make sure that I train my flaggers and I don't end up with situations like you see in this photo. <clears throat> I'm also going to address runovers and backovers. And those are an issue. According to the Labor Safety Fund of North America, they go into how are roadway construction workers killed. So you look at the number of workers killed each year, it turns out that 41% of them are actually killed by what I call friendly fire. You're run over by one of your own vehicles. So you actually have more to fear from your coworkers than you do the traveling public. That's only 22.5% of the time. So how do you avoid that? Well, first off, if you're the driver, if you can, get out of the truck and look before you back up. If you can't, use a spotter. And really, in setting up the work zone, if we can fix the uh, material delivery and everything else within the work zone where they don't have to back up, that's even better. But at the very least, turn off your radio, and I'm talking about your music playing, roll down your windows, use your four ways and your backup alarm. And that way, if your windows are rolled down, if you're about to run over somebody, they can actually, they'll start screaming and you'll hear them and you'll be able to stop. Let's see, if you're the employee, keep your head on a swivel. Watch out for that equipment. Don't get run over. Make sure you're wearing a safety vest, at least class two. And if you want to upgrade to be a little safer, put on a class three and then listen and pay attention to those backup alarms. Right, so I have a comment from Bruce and he says, man, the stats on the cause of fatalities is shocking. Yeah, I absolutely. When I dug into that and found that out, I didn't realize that you were more likely to be killed by your own teammate. So we have a little bit of time left. And what I'd like to do is first open it up to questions from you. Any kind of comments or questions that you might have. And as we're waiting for those to be either put in the chat box or you don't mute yourself, I'm going to run a few more poll questions for you just as a um, check, knowledge check. So question six, a job site inspection should be done when? And again, by the way, as you're answering these polls, if you have questions, 
feel free to put those or comments in the chat box. Also, if you want to ask it verbally, you can. A quick way to unmute yourself is to hold down the space bar. And while the space bar is held down, you're unmuted. When you let go of it, you go back to mute. Hey, looks like almost everybody has answered. So I'm going to end the poll in a second. Let me share the results with you. The best answer is A and B, and 90% of you got that. So when you install it, initial install, and then preferably once per shift, those are the best answers. So we have a, a question in the chat box, a good one. And this question, I'll launch another poll question as I'm answering that. Brian says, are there any KYTC specific stats? Yes. And if you want to do a little bit of digging, what I would encourage you to do, Brian, is to go to workzonesafety.org. I'm going to put that website into the chat box. And there you can look at not only the uh, work zone crash data for the nation, but you can also look at state specific crash data. And you can drill down and find a lot of the answers or the information that you're looking for. So I would encourage you to go to workzonesafety.org. Also, if you come to some of our workshops, we'll dig a little bit deeper into the Kentucky-specific data. All right, I see many of you are answering the poll questions. Good job. Looks like most of you are done with that. I'm going to end the poll, share the results. The best answer for an enhancement to the advanced warning area is A, increase the size of the signs. That might be one of the first things we would consider. Go from that 36 inch to 48 inch sign. Today, what we talked about was understanding job site removal, setup and removal. And we went over that ATSA guide, field guide to the installation and removal of temporary traffic control devices. And then we gave you some information on job site management, and primarily we used what we find in the MUTCD for that. So at this point, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Brittany for any kind of closing comments she might have and just say thank you for attending. And Brittany, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Todd, for joining us and sharing all of that information. Uh, that was very valuable for a lot of us, I know, that are on this webinar. Um, the presentation has been shared with you all, both in your confirmation letter and in the chat box earlier, but if you need a copy of that, just let me know. Uh, thank you all for taking your time to be here with us today. I have dropped the ATSA link to the field guide because it was a little hard to find, um, but I'm also going to drop now the evaluation link and a link to some of our resources like social media, training calendar, and then specific program information. So please take a few minutes to complete that evaluation. It is short, but it is very important for us to be able to revise these programs for future attendees. Uh, we really appreciate your honest comments on those. Certificates will be emailed out to you by the end of the week um, to answer your question, Brian. So you'll receive those via email. And then check your, check your junk mail if you don't receive it. Sometimes they do go into there as spam. Um, I think Todd can hang out for another minute or two if you have any questions, but if you don't, have a great day and we'll see you next time.